Hi everyone and welcome. Today I'm going to tell you about adversarial examples in neural networks at random initialization. This is joint work with Yashwant Cherapanam Jerry, Gauthier Gidel, and Remy Tachedekon. And it's a follow up paper on a very nice paper of Amit Danieli and Hadas uh, Shaham. So let me tell you what is the setting. We're going to consider a two layers neural network. So this is a function f from rd to r which you can uh, represent picturally as, as the following uh, computation. So you have the input x, which I'm going to represent as d nodes like this. Okay, so one for each coordinate. So here you have x1, etc., up to xd. Now this input layer is connected to a hidden layer, so one hidden layer, which is going to be constituted of k neurons. So this is going to be k. k is either smaller than d or bigger than d. And uh, these layers are connected through edges. Okay, so what it means is, um, you know, this node here, for instance, it gets a weighted combination of the input uh, node. That's what this guy gets. And then there is some nonlinear activation function, maybe the rectified linear unit of some other function that gives you the output of this neuron. And then they are all of them linearly combined to give you the output f of x. Okay, so I will have a more precise uh, mathematical notation uh, later on in the talk to, to give you the output f of x. And if you followed the previous lectures, you know what a one hidden layer neural network looks like. Now we're going to look for this lecture at uh, this neural network at random initialization. So what it means is that those edges, they have weights. As I said, the output is a weighted combination of the input. And the weights at initialization, they are random, Gaussian, centered, zero mean, and with variance one over the input width. So what does it mean one over the input width? Well, for the hidden layer, so let's say for this node, uh, for this node, the Input is a d-dimensional vector, so 1 over the input width is 1 over d. Over here, for the, for the second layer, for the linear output layer, the width, the input width is k, it's a hidden uh, neuron, so the input width is k, so the weight is 1 over k for the uh, variance. So this is either equal to 1 over d or 1 over k. Okay? And why does this uh, scaling make sense? It makes sense because you see, if I have a, a scale one node here, if all the input are of scale of order one, then the output of, of a node is also of scale one. Why is it? Well, note that if you have a sum, let's say for L equals one to K of let's say, uh, maybe, or maybe let me say for i equals one to d of xi times a Gaussian and zero, one over d, then which is, you know, what, what the input to this neuron is gonna be, then this is distributed as a distribution as a Gaussian with variance, the sum of the xi squared over d. Okay, so this neuron, you know, the, let, let's say this neuron, what it sees is basically a Gaussian with variance sum of the xi squared over d. So if all of the xi is of, are of scale 1, then sum of the xi squared over d is of scale 1, so this neuron is of scale 1. Similarly, so that means all those neurons are going to be of scale 1, and so this output is also going to be of scale 1. Okay, so the claim, the easy claim that we just made, is that with high probability, f of x, you know, f of x is going to be uh, of size 1 for x in the square root d radius sphere. Okay, so why, why square root d radius sphere? Notice that this here, this variance, is nothing but uh, the L2 norm squared of x divided by d. So if the L2 norm of x is square root d, which is this assumption, then this number, this variance is going to be 1. So for a point x, which is in square root d, uh, uh, radius, square root d radius sphere, 
then we see that each input of the k neuron is going to be an n01, and so when they combine, they, they are going to give us a scale one output. Okay, so this is an easy calculation. Now, here is the question that we are going to want to study in this presentation. The question is, right now I just told you that this scaling of random weights is the correct scaling if you want to have an output which is of order 1 for an input where each coordinate is of order 1. Right? Notice, of course, that if you are in the hypercube in minus 1, 1 to the d, then the altitude norm is square root d, so you're in square root d times uh, the sphere. So the question is, what uh, more generally, instead of just having the magnitude, just the height of this function at a fixed point, we can ask, what is the landscape? What is the landscape of f? All right? Can we can we say more generally what the function f looks like on the entire sphere? And you know, uh, uh, owing to the title of the presentation, can we understand adversarial examples? Can we? understand uh, adversarial examples in this model. Right? So this is a very simple model. We're just saying, let's, let's take a, a, a randomly initialized one hidden layer neural network. Can we understand what, what adversarial examples look like? Can we prove that they exist, that gradient descent can find them? Okay, all, all of that good stuff that we would like to understand. And the answer is yes, we can understand this. So here is the theorem that uh, we're going to prove together in, in, in this lecture. So theorem. So this is in our joint work, and I will explain how it builds on what uh, Danieli and Shaham uh, did. So let's fix an input, x, in square root d times the sphere. Fix also k, which is the uh, uh, width. And let's say k is larger than some constant. Okay, constant is, is, is some, you know, a hundred or something like that. And it's smaller than some, it's slightly sub-exponential in the dimension. Let's say it's smaller than exponential d to the point one. Okay, so it's a, a little bit smaller than, than exponential in the dimension. Uh, fix also, fix a smooth nonlinearity. So let's say the activation function is smooth or uh, ReLU. Okay, so our, our theorem is also going to apply to the rectified linearity. So either a smooth nonlinearity or a rectified linearity. Then the claim is the following. Then with high probability, this model uh, admits adversarial example, namely, there exists a perturbation delta in Rd such that one, delta is indeed a small perturbation. So the norm of delta is smaller than some constant. Now notice that a constant, that's, you know, nothing but another constant times the norm, or the same constant actually, the norm of x over square root d. Okay, so when I say that the norm of delta is smaller than a constant, it means that with respect to x, it's something small. Okay, it's of order of the norm of x divided by square root d. And second, and more importantly, this perturbation is an adversarial example, namely the sine of f at x plus delta. So when I apply this tiny perturbation to x, I actually change the sign of the prediction. So the sign is not equal to the sign of x. Okay, so this is exactly what we would call an adversarial perturbation. f at the input x, it has some, you know, constant uh, value. It's maybe, you know, point, ten, point, point you know, I don't know. 0.7 or you know maybe 1.2 or it's some some constant value or minus 1.2 I don't know and you apply a tiny perturbation of order one over square root d I mean norm of x over square root d and you're going to change uh, the sign of the output so this is exactly what we mean by an adversarial example and we see that at initialization we're going to be able to prove that they exist and moreover and this is a key point moreover delta equals constant times the gradient of f at x works. So not only do we have adversarial examples, but in fact, one step of gradient descent is gonna is gonna work. Okay, and and let's say and note that this constant is either you know plus one or minus one. It's it's either in the direction of the gradient or in minus the direction of the gradient because either you want to increase the output, let's say if f was negative at x, or you want to decrease the output if f was positive. 
Okay, so this is the theorem that we're going to prove, and this is the theorem we have in our paper. Now, let me make a comment. In, in the paper by Danieli and Shafam, they only consider the rectified linear unit, and they prove the same, essentially the same result, except that they need a much more drastic uh, restriction on the width. Namely, they need k, the number of hidden units, as a number of neurons, to be smaller than the dimension. Whereas here, we can allow it to be almost exponential in the dimension, and it remains an open problem to, to do it beyond exponential in the dimension. As we explained in the paper, there are some connections to spin glasses in this case, which are uh, very interesting to elucidate, but this is beyond the scope of this presentation. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is that I'm going to prove this theorem to you or explain to you how, how the proof works. Okay, so, so let's do that. So let's do the analysis. So for the analysis, we're going to introduce some notation. So I'm going to write f of x is going to be the sum for L equals 1 to k. I have k neuron. Each neuron is going to have, you know, weighted by AL for the output weight. And the else neuron, it's you use a nonlinear activation function psi applied to w dot x. And w is a, is a weight corresponding to the else neuron, where per our initialization, the al are Gaussian with uh, uh, variance 1 over the input width, which is 1 over k. And the wl are Gaussian centered. And with input with with variance one over the input width, which is d. So one over d times the identity, because here uh, we're taking a d-dimensional vector. Okay, so so this is the function that that we're looking at. And of course, the gradient of f of x is very easy to calculate. It's nothing but the sum by linearity for one to k of a l times the derivative, the gradient with respect to x of psi of wl dot x, it's wl times psi prime of wl dot x. So this is wl times psi prime of wl dot x. And we're going to make two claims. So the claim one is going to be that the norm, so with high probability, the norm of the gradient of f at x is at least a constant. Okay, I don't know, 0.1. That's, that's going to be the first claim. Very, very easy to prove. We'll do it together. And the second claim, more subtle and more interesting, is that, again, with high probability, we're going to get the following uh, uh, bound. For any delta, such that the norm of delta is little o of square root d, Okay, so for any perturbation which is small, which is little o of the norm of x, we will have that the norm of the gradient of f of x minus the gradient of f of x plus delta. Okay, so we do a perturbation. We move to uh, x plus delta, and we look at how, how the gradient is changing. And we're going to see that this change is little o of the norm of the gradient. Okay, so these two claims, uh, they will by themselves conclude the picture, uh, conclude the proof, sorry. So let me, let me explain what is the picture. So the picture is, is, is like this. So this is, you know, uh, this potato is uh, square root d times the sphere, the unit sphere. And now we have some x here. And we're looking at a ball here. Which is which are all the x plus delta, where the norm of delta is little o of square root d. Okay, so we have exponentially many disjoint sphere like this in the square root d radius sphere. And what these two claims show is that in here I have some gradient, which is of of you know significant size. It's a it's a good chunk. It's a real it's a real gradient. And now everywhere in this sphere, all the other gradients they are all correlated. In fact, okay, they are all more or less pointing in the same direction because the distance between one of those green arrow and the green arrow at the center is little o, you know, little o of one in this case. Okay, so what does it tell me? It tells me that if I start at x 
and I do a step in the direction of the gradient, then I must, you know, I'm basically, I have a linear landscape, which is only slightly folded, you know, there is some perturbation to this linear landscape, but it's mostly a linear landscape. So when I do a step of size one, over there, I'm going to decrease or increase the value depending if I move into the direction of the gradient or negative gradient. I will change the value of my function by of order one. And since I know I have said at the beginning that you know the value at x is of order one, then by just stepping at a constant distance from x, I will change the the sign either you know from minus to plus or from plus to minus. Okay, and I I, I hope this is clear. And in fact, we'll see so. Uh, towards the end, I will explain, you know, we have all these different balls like this. And, you know, we have these different, uh, you know, you can think about the blue scale is a macroscopic scale. Now the red scale is kind of this mesoscopic scale, which is in between microscopic and, and, and microscopic. And we'll see that at the mesoscopic scale, we have this linear function. And in fact, all these linear functions, they are more or less pointing in the same direction. So there exists also a universal adversarial perturbation. I, I will comment on this later. But for now, before we get into this universal adversarial perturbation business, let me prove to you claim one and claim two. They are both uh, pretty simple. So claim one, again, let's, let's do the proof of claim one. So we care about the gradient of f of x, which is uh, the sum of al, wl, Psi prime of wl dot x, right? Now notice this is a Gaussian, right? With variance one over d times the identity, and wl dot x. This is also a Gaussian. This is an n zero one, right? Because x is of norm square root d, so uh, wl dot x is a Gaussian of of norm zero and and variance one. Okay. Now, wl and wl dot, dot x are correlated uh, Gaussian. wl dot x depends on x. But I can look at, you know, the norm. I, I only need to lower bound the norm of the gradient. So I can lower bound it by the norm of the projection of the gradient on the orthogonal component to x. And of course, when I project on the orthogonal component to x, what do I see? Um, you know, WL projected on the orthogonal component of X is independent of WL dot X. Okay. So let me uh, say this again. Um, maybe let me write it like this. Um, so say, say BL is equal to AL psi prime of WL dot X. Okay, this is a number. Then what do we have? We have the, the gradient of f of x is a sum of uh, BL and let's say projection on x orthogonal. Then this is a projection on x orthogonal of WL. So this is just a linear combination of independent Gaussian and the weights are independent of the Gaussians. So this is equal in distribution in fact, it's completely equal in distribution to a, a Gaussian, a centered Gaussian with variance, the sum of the BL squared, right? And it's divided by D because my WL have variance one over D and it's time the identity in dimension D minus one uh, because the projection on, on the orthogonal complement of WL is a D minus one dimensional vector, okay? So we get that this, this thing, is in fact equal to uh, square root of the sum of the BL uh, squared, okay, for L equals one to K, times the norm of a Gaussian of variance one over D times the identity. Now this thing, it's very easy to see that this concentrate is, it's, 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 Roughly one or d minus one over d. Maybe I should write just to, to be clear. This is roughly d minus one over d. And the sum of the BL squared, well, AL is, is a Gaussian of variance one over k. So this thing is a Gaussian, you know, of variance just this psi prime of x. So this is also going to be 
a constant with high probability. So this whole thing is a constant. Okay, and, and the way you prove this is, uh, you know, it's very easy. You just use the concentration of, of chi-squared random variables, for instance. It's, it's an easy exercise. And that gives you claim one. Okay, so claim one, again, it just says that the, not only do we have that the function value of this randomly initialized uh, two layers neural network is some constant, but also the norm of the gradient is some constant. Okay, so now claim two is uh, slightly more delicate. Claim two is going to be this uh, fact that we want uh, to control the supremum over delta such that the norm of delta is little o of square root d of the norm of grad f of x minus grad f of x plus delta. Okay, so the way we're going to do this is we will do an epsilon net argument, epsilon net over delta. Okay, so, so again, with respect to my previous picture, I have x here, and I'm going to do a net over all the possible x plus delta. Okay, I'm going to have a fine net uh, of 1 over epsilon. So, you know, this has size, the size of the net is 1 over epsilon to the d. Okay, so I'm going to do an epsilon net argument over delta. And because I do an epsilon net argument over delta, I can also replace this norm. It's always a little bit annoying to think about the norm of random vector. It's easier to think about scalar random quantities. So I'm just going to write this as a supremum over delta, such that the norm of delta is little o of square root d. And also v in the sphere. And I replace the norm by the supremum over v in the sphere of the inner product between v and grad f of x minus grad f of x plus delta. And I will also do an epsilon net over delta and v. Okay, so I will both discretize over the direction v, which gives me the norm, and the delta, uh, the perturbation that I'm looking at. Okay, and that, I, it doesn't cost me much more uh, because both are going to be of size 1 over epsilon to the d. Okay, very good. So now all I need to compute is in a product between V and grad F of X minus grad F of X plus delta, try to show that for fixed V and delta, uh, this is small with very, very high probability, the new number over the epsilon net and then extend from the epsilon net to the whole uh, domain. Okay, so let, let's do those steps. So what is this? This is nothing but the sum for L equals one to K of AL, and then what do I get? I get WL in our product with V, and then I get the difference between Psi prime at WL dot X and Psi prime at WL dot X plus delta. Okay, this is, this is uh, what I get. Now, uh, let me introduce uh, some notation. I, I'm gonna write this as a sum of XL, okay, where XL is this whole thing. And my goal is now gonna be to apply some concentration inequality. So Bernstein, for instance, Bernstein inequality will tell me that the sum of the XL is upper bounded up to some constant, doesn't matter, by uh, square root of K times sigma squared log one over delta, plus b log one over delta. And that's assuming uh, this is true if the expectation of xl is zero. Uh, the expectation of xl squared is bounded by sigma squared. And the absolute value of xl is almost surely bounded by b. Okay. So we won't be able to apply literally this version of Bernstein because B, the, the almost sure upper bound of XL is not true because the WL is Gaussian, so it has some probability of taking a very large value, but we're not gonna worry about this, okay? So this part is just technical, it doesn't matter, you can bound basically higher moments. Instead, what's more interesting is that I'm gonna focus on, on this part, okay? So of course, XL, notice that XL is of course of expectation zero, just because AL is of expectation zero as a Gaussian. So all we need to do is to compute the expectation of x, xl squared and see what Bernstein is going to give us. 
So what is the expectation of xl squared? So expectation of xl squared, what is this? See, this is the expectation of al squared wl dot v square. Uh, and then we get psi prime of wl dot x minus psi prime of wl dot x plus delta. And this is also square. Okay, so AL is independent of everything else, and the expectation of AL squared is 1 over K. So we get 1 over K. Then WL dot V, this is a, a, a Gaussian. Uh, v is a, is a unit vector. So WL dot V, uh, it has variance 1 over D. So this is an N0, uh, 1 over D. Okay, so the expectation of the square is 1 over D, and it's not quite, you know, independent of those things but let me get away with this you know it's it's easy again you can check the paper for the exact details but let's assume that wl dot v and wl dot x and wl dot x plus delta are, are you know independent meaning x is orthogonal to v and x plus delta is orthogonal to v it's not exactly true but it's essentially true so what we get is that this is basically one over k times d okay the k comes from the l squared the wl dot v gives me the other one over d times the expectation of psi prime of wl dot v dot x sorry minus psi prime of wl dot x plus delta squared uh, here parenthesis okay and now this is where you know naturally I'm going to use the smoothness of, of psi I said in my theorem that it's going to apply either to the rectified linear unit or to a smooth activation function. So let's now do the smooth, smooth case. Okay, so let's start with the smooth case. So in the smooth case, this variance is going to be bounded by 1 over kd times the expectation. And now I use smoothness to say that this is smaller than, uh, you know, the, the distance between wl dot x and wl dot x plus delta, which is wl dot delta squared. But now wl dot delta, this is a Gaussian with variance norm of delta over d, norm of delta squared over d. So this whole thing is simply 1 over kd, uh, norm of delta squared over d. Okay, so Bernstein with uh, sigma sigma squared equals uh, 1 over kd norm of delta squared over d gives me the following. And I just realized in Bernstein, yeah, it's, it's all good. It's the log 1 over delta. So Bernstein gives me, with probability at least 1 minus delta, I get that the sum of the XL is upper bounded by, uh, so I get square root of this times K. So I get norm of delta over D times square root of log one over delta over D plus something which we're not gonna worry about in this presentation. And now I'm in very good shape. Why is that? So now I can union bound over epsilon net and I will get for all delta and V in net, you know, now I just need to have the probability one over delta to be one over epsilon, I mean delta to be one over epsilon to the D. So log one over delta is gonna cancel with the D and I will get over all Uniformly over all delta and v in the net, xl, which depends on delta and v, is upper bounded by the norm of delta over d, which is a little over of 1 by assumption. Okay, so I have proven that on the net, the difference between all the gradient and the gradient at the center is small. Now I need to extend from the net to the whole space. And let me go back uh, up there. So again, what we're looking at, XL, it's this thing. 
and you see as I vary v, as I vary v, this is smooth. This is Lipschitz when I vary v. So it's easy to extend from the net to the whole sphere just because it's it's Lipschitz in v. And similarly, because psi pi is smooth, it's also Lipschitz in delta. But you see that for ReLU, it's going to be harder to extend from the net to the entire uh, um, neighborhood um, because it's not going to be smooth in delta. Okay. So this concludes the proof uh, for the smooth case. Okay. So this concludes proof for smooth. Now for the ReLU, uh, so now let's move on to the ReLU case. And remember, where, where did we depart uh, between the smooth and the ReLU case? It's here. When I used in here, I used that Psi prime is Lipschitz, namely Psi is smooth, to upper bound the difference between Psi prime and T and Psi prime and S between Psi prime of T minus Psi prime of S is smaller than T minus S. But this is not true for the ReLU case. But for the ReLU case, what is it? So let's let's do it. So for the ReLU case, we have the expectation again of psi prime of WL dot x minus psi prime of WL dot x plus delta and uh, square. And psi prime for the ReLU is just the step function. Okay, so this is just the expectation. Uh, let me write it, of the indicator that wl dot x is positive minus the indicator of, you know, wl dot x plus delta uh, is positive. So you see, the only way this is different is if wl dot x and wl dot x plus delta do not have the same sign. Okay, so this is smaller than, in fact, the probability that the sign of wl dot x is different from the sign of WL dot X plus delta. But now notice that um, X and delta are not on the same scale. So WL dot X, this is a standard Gaussian. And WL dot uh, delta, this is in fact a Gaussian with variance norm of delta squared over d. So it's a much smaller thing. It's a ver the variance is little o of 1. Now the only way this, these signs are different is if the size of wl dot delta is larger than the size of wl dot x. Right? If it's smaller, then it cannot change its sign. But this is a Gaussian, again, with variance uh, norm of delta squared over d. So the only way, you know, this wl dot x is going to be of size 1 roughly. I mean, it's a Gaussian or it's, it's going to be some size uh, O tilde of one, some log uh, with very, very high probability. So the only way is for this to be much larger than this uh, delta. And this will only happen with probability exactly norm of delta over D. So this is of order, you know, O tilde up to a log factor norm of delta over D. And you see, so what I bound, so this means that my sigma squared in this case is going to be norm of delta over d uh, times the 1 over kd. Okay, so the 1 over kd, let me remind you where it comes from. The 1 over kd, it comes from those terms in the variance calculation. Okay. And you see before for the smooth case, I, I had 1 over kd times norm of delta squared over d. And now I just get, uh, in this case, I get uh, norm of delta, sorry, over square root D. Okay. So I just get the square root of what I had before. So everything will go through the same. So, so by, by uh, Bernstein, I will get for the ReLU case that the sum of the XL is upper bounded by norm of delta over square root D. But the square root of that times square root of log 1 over delta over d plus something that we don't care about in this presentation. 
Okay, so it's exactly the same as for the smooth case, except I have a rate of convergence which is a little bit weaker. It's square root of what it was before. But the important thing is that I still get this square root log one over delta over d. So I can do still do a net argument. Um, I can still do a net argument. I can still union bound over the epsilon net. And now the last difficulty. Um, is extend from the net on delta to all delta. And why is this a difficulty? It's a difficulty because now we cannot, you know, rely on the smoothness uh, of, of the ReLU because it's not smooth. Uh, so what we have to do is, is a different argument and, and, you know, maybe it would take another five or ten minutes to, to do it. So, so maybe I will skip it. Okay, so this concludes uh, the proof. And let me say, maybe let me make a comment about where the sub-exponential widths come in. It comes in in, uh, in the union bound over the epsilon net. So here, when I said, for instance, that we conclude the proof for the smooth function, what you will see is that you need to pick epsilon to be of order one over k. So this will introduce another log k factor, a log k over, over uh, yeah, basically a log k. And this log k will be the sub-exponential width uh, condition. Okay, and I will just uh, leave it at that. Okay, and the last comment I want to make, uh, last comment, is that actually for ReLU, you can also show that uh, the sum of the ALWL is uh, uh, aligned with the gradient. But this sum of ALWL, you see, it's a, it's a direction which does not depend on x. So it means that there is a direction which does not depend on x and along which you will find adversarial examples. Okay, so this is this phenomenon of universal adversarial perturbation, which is very puzzling that there exists adversarial perturbation which are you know, not dependent on the input that you can you know, apply to basically any image, for instance, in image data sets. So that's very interesting. Let me say, though, that this sum of ALWL does depend on the network. And universal perturbation, they do not only generalize across input examples, but they also are, uh, generalize across architectures. So this simple observation does not explain the generalization across architectures. And there is a very nice paper by Zeyuan Alenju and Yuan Zhu Li uh, on feature purification, how, you know, deep learning, adversarial deep learning performs, uh, well, adversarial deep learning, I guess, or, or does robust deep learning, where they try to explain the existence of universal perturbation both across input and across architectures. But that uh, will be for another time. And let me also say again, one of the open problem is to uh, obtain those results for ultra wide uh, one hidden layer neural networks meaning when the width is exponential in the dimension, I believe it shouldn't be too hard uh, to do for the, for the smooth case, and may, maybe we'll do it uh, soon. Uh, but for the ReLU, it, it does seem uh, quite a bit harder and probably very different. Maybe the best way to proceed for the ReLU is to connect it with the theory of spin glasses. Uh, so this is, uh, again, another direction. There is a paper by uh, Ronan Eldan, uh, Tzlil Schramm, and Dan Mikkelinser studying the rate of convergence of one hidden layer neural network to their spin glass limit. And they do have results for the ReLU, so maybe you can connect those different projects. Uh, that's all I wanted to say for today. Thank you very much.